I am indeed. Okay, if everyone can just um, press the got it button to uh, permit recording to take place of your feed. And uh, could I just ask that when you're not actually speaking that you keep your microphones muted because it makes the whole thing run much smoother and avoids um, other people being deafened by your barking dog or your budgie or something. Uh, and without any more of me waffling on, I shall pass you all over to, to Jack Cornish. Thanks again, Jack, for coming. That's fine, thanks, thanks for having me. Um, I was sort of thinking, I think as John sort of intimated, this is gonna be quite a informal, relaxed session and hopefully, uh, but hopefully still helpful. Um, John, I, I think probably it'd be best if I went through the questions that you sent me in advance that I got. Um, uh, I'm not 100% sure I know who they're from. So um, I will just, I would just read the question and read the, uh, and then I'll, I'll explain the answer. Um, so the first question was, uh, what sort of support and advice can the Ramblers give on specific routes? Um, so I think, as I sort of was saying at the last session, we are building up our resources for individuals to support, um, uh, to do the research on lost rights of way. And we'll hopefully be, you know, certainly by the end of this calendar year, we'll have a lot more out there for people to get going with, with that. Um, we also are really trying to foster, you know, we've got really expert members of staff. We've also got really expert volunteers, some of which have submitted, you know, several hundreds applications. Um, so we're really foster, trying to foster, you know, people to help each other. And there's, even though, you know, each path and each application, you know, I, I, I'm not going to say that it's something that can be done overnight, but it's a little research project. But most things that people come across in an application will have been, you know, come across by someone else before. So um, there are forums. There is a forum, for instance, where there's quite a lot of expert people on there that can help you questions. I can I can help with with some of the questions as well. Um, and then also I'm working with uh, Tim, who's here as Karen Spray today, um, to hopefully you know we want to build up a network of of local support as well. But it will be a bit of, you know, with all of these things and with, a, with a, an organisation that's so volunteer led, um, we've got 100 members of staff and 20,000 volunteers. Um, you know, there is a, an element of working together to sort of build up the knowledge and, 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 to, and to get you know, good, good applications submitted. So I sort of hope that answers the question. But if, if the person who asked that is here and it didn't, there is anything specific, I can pick that up afterwards. Um, I, I, I see, and it was from me. Oh, it's in, yeah. Um, so I guess my question there is partly, is there, do you have like a regional coordinator or people that are sort of responsible for working for specific areas that might be a good first point of contact? I see Tim's unmuted. I don't know if you're going to say uh, anything on that. Uh, so yeah, so I'm, as Jack said, I'm the coordinator for, for Devon. And then within Devon, we have a number of um, sub coordinators who are looking after specific areas of the country, oh, sorry, of the county. And also, we've got a few people uh, in the group that have, as Jack said, have um, worked this process over the last 20 years, um, not just because of this project, but just over the last however many years, people have been trying to get paths back. So, we do have a lot of local knowledge. When it comes down to the Tiss Valley area in particular, then we have um, some parishes that are part of East Devon um, and Rosemary, who's here as Alan, but invisible. Then Rosemary has great knowledge of a lot of the East Devon parishes and a lot of the uh, paths that we tried to get in the past, either successfully or not successfully. And then we have John and Bob from the extra side. So between those three and other people we can get involved, we can then, if anybody's got a suggestion for a path, we can have a look, see whether we've tried it in the past whether it got rejected, whether it's something we're actively going for, or whether it's something we actually should put on the list. And then we would work through how to research that and how to move it to fruition. So yeah, there are people locally. And then we, if we need to, we can go to um, more central resources to get legal help if need be, or um, other um, support from some of the um, uh, offices we need to go to, like the um, office in queue with some of the data or some of the, the uh, documents that we'd like to look at. So I think we'd start local. So, you know, it'd be the likes of Rosemary, John, Bob on here as well, some other people locally who would help look at these paths and 
uh, give some background and then we can extend it if we need more help outside. And I think the I think the other thing I would add to that that sort of brings me on to I presume it's your second question, uh, the same the second question from you um, is that you know one thing that that local knowledge is really important because you know I'm trying to centrally capture that but it's obviously difficult but what we've definitely found over as 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 Tim says over many years and what I found over the last uh, you know over the last couple of years is that there may be in one county a really good evidence source that is really well documented and you know uh, really accessible in a in an archive that just doesn't exist in most other places um so there is an element of you know what works best in in devon you know how were the maps produced what quality are they you know there's there's those sort of issues that that as as tim says hopefully you know tapping into people that have done this before uh, locally really really help but obviously i do as anything i can to support centrally as well um with that and that sort of brings me on to the next question um which was what are the best sources of providing footpaths specifically from my initial research they've been much less prevalent than roads as they're not shown on tide maps or most old maps except the os maps so yeah the, you know footpaths are harder to claim um but they are very by no means possible. They're harder to claim because, you know, essentially most of the records we're looking at, as I think I said in the first session, are not created for specifically for you know recording rights of way in, in, the, in the way that we're looking at them now. Uh, you know, a lot of them are about maintenance and tax and things like that. And so then they exist a lot, of, there are a wider range of records to use for um uh for uh applications for roads uh, well you know which would now be restricted byways however um there are some good sources of evidence and you know which which we've had volunteers um successful with so i was just going to quickly mention some of those now and again this is where some of this local knowledge are coming because some of these records might be relevant and might not be relevant for the for the area or they might be relevant for part of the area not the other part so if there is enclosure um, has happened, then if, you, if there's the enclosure maps available, they often do set out footpaths and bridleways. Um, and, and I think, as I said last time, they are pretty legally conclusive. The other one that will be, unless they've been sort of destroyed somewhere, that should be in uh, uh, evidence for all areas of Finance Act maps. So I think, as I said last time, people get deductions for rights of way over a parcel of land. They can be tricky because the parcels can be quite large. So if there's already some recorded rights of way, um, you know, that can sort of scupper that a bit. But I've definitely seen applications where an owner owned a field, there are no rights of way across it now. There was one deducted for the, you know, in the Finance Act maps, and therefore that's pretty, you know, it's good evidence. Um other, a couple of other records that are useful are um quarter sessions so that was essentially the the thing the predecessor to county courts and they often dealt with rights to way complaints and you know they were related to path well as as roads and the other one that probably isn't reflected quite as much in the um the bucks and wady book i talked about last time but that i know our volunteers in sussex have found really useful the parish records um as, as i think probably most of you who, who have you know been involved in a parish council anyway they they, they are really invested in the local area they like keeping quite detailed records of minutes and meetings and stuff like that so often parish records and especially minutes of parish councils if they're available which they often are in local archive centers you know can be can be talking about um either some work that they some money they spent on on uh, maintaining a, a path, a footpath, or or just sort of talking about a, a, a path, a right of way in their in their parish. Um, and then the other one that that I think doesn't really, again, this is where the local knowledge will be interesting. Um, again, uh, one of our volunteers in another part of the country has found a, a relatively unknown Act of Parliament called the Rights of Way Act, nineteen thirty-two. So it was before the um, the Act that created the definitive maps. 
essentially that was the act that brought in the uh, the um, ability for people to claim a path through um, user evidence for the first time. Uh, so you know the twenty years rule that I think I mentioned last time that was that act was was for that, but it also allowed um, landowners for the first time to deposit maps of um, where there were rights of way and where there weren't, like they can do now. Um, now, in some places, those records have just disappeared, uh, but in some places they are existent. And so if you've got a right of way that was deposited in one of those maps, uh, you know, in the thirties um, by a landowner, that's, that's, that's good evidence. And that's probably not, I think, mentioned too much in the Bucks and Wadey book that I talked about last time. So they're just a couple, uh, one other mention, again, might not be relevant, Railway and canal records are quite good with footpaths, especially um, after 1845 when they had to be much more detailed. Um, so if there are railways or even railways that were proposed and never built that they go through, you know, the patch, that, that, that can be useful. So hopefully, I don't know if there's any other follow-up questions on that or, or, we, or we can go afterwards, especially if you're still eating. <laughs> Just one on the 1932 yeah. uh, Act. Yeah. Where would we find those? Would that be National Archives, Parliamentary Archives, County Archives? So my understanding is they should be in the, um, you know, if they do exist, they probably will be in either one of two places. Uh, this is a slight, I'd need to double check this. Um, they'll either be in like the, the local records office and the archives. Um, I don't know how it's split up in Devon, but they'll be there. They might be there. I do all know so some other places where they they're just in the council offices, <laughs> which isn't particularly helpful. Um, so you know that might be something to that we can pick up with the rights of way team just in case. You know they might be shoved to the back of a cabinet somewhere, um, which I don't but it's probably worth double checking that okay. is that helpful Ian? yeah thank you very much that's okay yeah as i say i don't want to put anyone off but footpaths are a little bit trickier to claim um and, and i often do say that if if you've got paths that are currently in use um and you know it, it i suppose this is a general point but especially for for footpaths and bridleways um it, it may be better to to, to see if you can, you know, put, if the energy is best to spend on, on seeing if you can get enough user evidence uh, claims, uh, you know, forms. Yeah, can I throw something in there as well? Just, just so, just let you know what we've done over the last couple of months or so is as people who are already working on this in other parts of Devon have come up with their list of paths they're interested in, we've got a group of people, about five or six people that meet every two to three weeks, um, not so much during the summer. And we've taken a couple of those paths they're keen on, and people who've already done it have gone through and explained how to get at the various maps, how to get at the various documents, um, what the next step should be, and use it as a sort of training session for people. And as more people come on board, I would love to do that again and again and again, probably, just to a new person comes on, they've done their, they're digging into their paths, they've got a list, we take one or two, and we go through some examples of what we can look at, et cetera. And, and that I think has been quite helpful for some people in knowing what to do next. And then some of the other things to do is we need to go to county office or maybe the tax office in, in London is to see if we can group things together. So rather than go hundreds of times for one path, we look at what's in a parish or some joint parishes and we go and try and do a bunch of stuff at one go. So we, we, we are trying to get people to come together, share what we're looking at and then get advice from other people who've done it but also collect that information to, to minimise the number of trips you've got to do um, to, to various offices. So I think as people get involved, that's what I'd love to do is bring you into the, the group and, and go through examples and, and help with some training on that side of it. Yeah, I mean, that sounds like a great approach to me and and um, maybe, maybe Tim, you can invite me to a couple of those just so we can, you know, learn and, and share with, with other places around the country about the best way of doing this because, um, yeah, I think yeah. We'll, we'll cover that hopefully in a couple weeks' time, Jack, and just look at the way to go forward. But I think that'll be uh, something we want to continue to do because it is it is complicated. Some people, even people who've done it for ages, that you know, it, even if you ask a simple question, you can get a quite complex answer coming back <laughs> as to all the different options that you've got. So we'll actually go through a few examples and actually do it there and then is it, very helpful. Otherwise, ploughing through Bucks and Wadey or any other document 
can be a bit daunting. So I think it's that sort of Zoom call or whatever is quite quite strong. And uh, John. I was just going to say thanks very much for that, Tim. That's really helpful, uh, and I think that'll be a great asset to uh, um, anyone who's who's hoping to go on and actually really focus in on some particular paths. So thanks for that offer. A um, couple of questions from Peter, uh, which I will help with. Um, one is, are volunteers expected to become members of the Ramblers? Um, simple one, no. Um, I don't have any, I don't really, well, it's wrong to say I don't care if I'm a member of the Ramblers because I'd love people to join, but uh, I, I'm agnostic when it comes to don't use your way. Um, and we may have, well, we, we have coordinators, I think, who are not members, and we may have volunteers who volunteer on don't use your way for many years and never become members. Um, so there's no expectation at all. All of the resources we make available will be available to registered volunteers, but that does not mean you need to be a member of the Ramblers and we don't have anything in the process around that. Um, the next question is an interesting one. Uh, um, and I did double check this um, to get, I, I, I was right, but I did, I thought I'd double check it in my, my authoritative uh, uh, rights of way law. Um, what's the definition of a right of way? Do paths forming a, a right of, forming a right of way have to be a distinct start and end point. For instance, in Ashcliffe Forest, many paths are loops and do not serve a purpose of getting from A to B. So the, the answer to that is essentially that a path has to have at least one end. Um, so a right of way has to have at least one end. You can't have a right of way that is not connected to either another public right of way or to a highway. Um, but you can have cul-de-sac paths. I mean, probably most people might have been on one. Often they go down to the sea, but quite often cul-de-sac paths down to a, a river front, um, you know, uh, those sort of things. Uh, so you, you can have cul-de-sac paths and, um, you know, the path doesn't need to, yeah, it doesn't need to be a sort of A to B direct route. So, um, yeah, so there's absolutely fine. Obviously, you know, in our prioritization, I suppose we, um, you, you, I'm not, I'm certainly not saying we shouldn't be high, prioritizing highly any, um, I'm not saying this is a blanket rule, but obviously we, we obviously want connectivity to some extent in the network. So we might want to think about how useful the path is if it's a cul-de-sac path. But then again, I mean, looking at, you, you mentioned Ashcliffe Forest. Um, Obviously, that is an area of open access land. And so if you've got a cul-de-sac right away that it goes onto an area of open access land, that's fantastic. It's not, you know, it's sort of not a cul-de-sac then, I suppose. Um, does that answer your question, Peter? If it's the same Peter that's here. Yes, thank you. Yeah, that's really good. Thank you very much. Great. Um, was there any other questions, John, that came for in advance? As you remember. I'm just going to double check. I'll look at my emails again, but that'll take me a, a couple of minutes just to check well, through. Whilst you're doing that, John, can I ask one about permissive paths then, Jack? Yeah. Um, I mean, there's a few things about permissive paths. When you were talking about them at the, tra at the last session, I pulled off an OS map at random from my shelf here and uh, had a look. and. Um, I think it was mid, somewhere in mid Devon. There was one permissive path mapped on that, um, but uh, that's quite unusual, is, isn't it? Um, but the um, the real question I've got is is um, whether the the fact that the per per permissive path exists and perhaps has existed for some years, how, how does that affect then a um, appeal to make it a designated right of way does it does the fact that the permissive path is there does that um mean that you can't claim the usage um that people have made of that path whilst it's a per permissive path if you see what i mean yeah i do completely see what you mean so just to sort of go back one step in terms of what they are so these are essentially well 
the, the administrative path could just be someone putting up a sign saying you can you can use this but it's by permission you know that's that could be a permissive path i was walking in lincolnshire the other day and uh a um holiday camp had put a permissive path up that that meant that people didn't need to walk on the road i think it was you know mainly aimed at their clientele but they said it was fine and it was by permission um then also um permissive paths i think i need to look up exactly the legislation but they can be deposited with the local authority to say you know the, if, a, if a landowner really really wants to make sure that everyone knows that this is only by permission they can make a deposit and i think it knows that if the local authority are on it get then in that info given to the to the um, ordnance survey to to be on the maps i think so um so essentially because the landowner is saying that they're using it by permission and not as of right that means that the time when it was clear to the public and it has to be clear to the wider public that the path was permissive um that time can't be used um to make up the sort of the the 20 years is of user evidence so a couple of things about that one it has to be clear to the public um there were you know there are sort of old semi myths in in this about you can close a gate once a year you know and you can sort of block it up once a year and that stops it being permissive that might have been the case when everyone lived in one small community and they said it at the parish church you know once a year on sunday we're going to close close this off you know that that might have been a good enough but it's not in the sort of world we live in now um, so you know the signs have to be clear or, or deposited with the council um, but also a, a permissive a sign with a saying this is a permissive path going up would be a good trigger for looking at a 20 years usage claim before that point um, you know so that would be you know if, if it suddenly goes up and you've been everyone's been using it for years you can make a claim at that point or even if it's been up for years if you've got the evidence for 20 years before that you actually know when that was put up or deposited then that can be that can be claimed but I, I can't remember if i said this the last one but you know that is separate from the historical rights of way claims because um you know there are there's two different legal sort of processes happening here with the with the 20 years usage it's becoming um it's becoming a right of way through that usage. With the historical ones, it's already a right of way. So if somebody puts a permissive sign up, but there's historical evidence, it doesn't make any difference at all. Um, you can, you, you know, uh, and we probably, I know, of, again, I'm a bit of a position here. I know of a couple of landowners who have put up permissive signs after they realize that someone wants to claim it on historical grounds, thinking it will stymie it, but it won't. Or it shouldn't do as long as one's following the correct procedures. Uh, frozen. Yeah, yeah no. Peter. Uh, Peter's got his hand. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> That's very interesting about the, um, the you know the permissive paths because I do know of a few where there are signs up, um, but I would have no idea how to go about finding out when that sign was put up. How would you suggest we would do that? I mean that's that that is a problem. <laughs> um, I mean it may be worth looking. Um, I can't remember what they call. Is it that section thirty six? The deposits that landowners, if they're putting up a sign, especially if it's quite a sort of, you know, they've obviously spent a bit of money making a sign, for instance. Um, it's probably not unlikely that they put in a deposit as well. Um, I think they do have to renew those as well every twenty years or something, maybe um, maybe fifteen years. Um, so it's worthwhile looking on the council website. Um, I can have a dig and see if I can find them, but it should be in the sort of same place that the, the DMMO, the, the applications register is as well. But it might be worth looking because you might be able to trace it back through when they made the deposit rather than when the sign went up. But it is a difficult one because unless you were around and walking the path one day, then the sign went up the next day and wrote in a diary, <laughs> and, you know. Jack, so with, with those paths anyway, you've got to get the user evidence. So you've got to find people who will say they walked it for 20 years or their parents walked it or whatever. 
And I guess at the same time, you're going in to say there were no signs saying it yep. was a permissive path at that time. So I think you've got the same problem. You've got to find people who are prepared, and you've got to find a number of people. I don't know what the numbers are, 15, 20. I don't, I'm not sure what the, the number is, but you've got to find a few people that will testify or write a letter to say they did walk it. And, and that, as far as they were concerned, it, it was not a permissive path. It was a, just a path. So uh, yeah, I think the two things are linked. You've got to get that evidence from, from people. Haven't you? So, yeah, and they can be difficult because yeah. of that. Um, and potentially it can come down to, well, maybe not two people's words against each other, but, you know, a landowner's word against a number of people about when a sign went up and all the things like that. So in the flip side of the advice I said before, it may be that if, it, you know, if, if there is a case like that, that historical evidence is the better way to go because, you know, that's just on the basis of the evidence rather than uh, a, a sort of... Um, recall memories from maybe a number of years ago i think the other the other thing i think to be slightly careful with i guess is if there is a landowner who's been quite helpful giving a permissive path and then he finds that we're trying to make it into a right of way there is a danger that he takes away the permission to walk along that path and fights it to the nail so i think there may be times when we think well we'd like you to make it a right of way but we've got other fish to fry as it were so let's make that not a high priority because already permissive path and the landowner is letting us walk it. Doesn't necessarily mean we won't do it, just we've got to be slightly careful. I think we don't want to lose a permissive path because we, we go into aggressively or something. So it's something we've got to think about, I think. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. And, and I'm not I'm not disagreeing, but the only the, the obviously the, the challenge we've got with the cutoff date yeah. is that you know we may say oh it's not, you know, it may be that in 20. Uh, 2028, a new the land ownership changes and they cut and they yeah, stop the permissive path. Yeah, so it's it's the priority. It's what we can do in the next four years. Yeah, we can't do everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I completely agree. I completely agree. It's, it's a big landowner, like you know, if it's a woodland commission or something like that, who's given the permission permissive path. I guess you feel slightly more um, yeah. confident that will stay for a lot longer. If it's an individual landowner, then maybe it's more of a challenge. So yeah, definitely, big institutional ones are yeah. You'd, you'd hope that it would be more in, in perpetuity. Did we, did anyone have other questions in the room? Or on email, John? In answer to that question, Jack, I've I've looked through my emails and I can't find any other questions uh, that anyone submitted apart from the two different people who said that they weren't able to be here this evening and were asking whether it was going to be recorded or not because they were hoping it was going to be. So, uh, yeah, no other questions about um, paths and content and evidence. Okay, um, I thought, I mean, obviously, if people get more questions coming up, that'd be great. I thought maybe we could, uh, uh, oh, Peter, yeah, we'll go for your question, Peter. Yeah, I, I have a, a question really, which is just to say, when can I get started? Because I've been a few of these meetings now and I just really like to get, get on and do something. Um, brilliant, brilliant. <laughs> so have you regist you're registered on the system? Well, I'm not sure because I, I wasn't sure whether I needed to register with the Ramblers or do I just register as a volunteer with the Ramblers or is it somewhere else I register? I'm not sure. I can't remember the process. If you go onto the Don't Use Your Way map, I think it will yeah. point you at the direction to volunteer. So, send so, you a, a link sorry. because I, I had some problem finding that, which is why I you know, explains my previous question about whether I had to join the Ramblers in order to be able to get full access to the site. Or... Yeah. <clears throat> So, so just to say where we're up to with sort of the registering side of things, this is not to say you can't, you can't, you know, you have to wait until this, but um, so anyone can go on the map, you have to make, you have to create an account, but it, you don't need to be a member or anything. Um, and we've got thousands of people on the map who are not members. Um, and then within hopefully in the next month or so, we'll be introducing an actual formal researcher role, which we're going to ask people to sign up to. And that will, a you know bring them into the tent in terms of giving them resources and, and everything um but also it will also give them a bit more additional functionality on the map as well um so yeah that would be great uh, see john's got his hand up 
Yeah, I'll send the link uh, for the web address for that right to you now, Peter. Um, yeah. <laughs> if you've got specific parishes that you are keen to get involved in, or you may have told me this already, I can't remember, but specific parishes or specific paths or whatever, then you know, I can link you with the people that are looking after those group of parishes. So we can and tell you if there's anybody already looking at that parish um, from our point. Doesn't, doesn't stop you doing it. You know, the more that look at it, sometimes the better. But we can at least say that there is somebody else already looking at it so we can get you in touch with them. And if there's nobody else, then we can say, right, that's your parish or where you go. Start looking at the paths, prioritize them. And then as Jack said, we move into the research mode where we take a set of paths and say, right, these are the ones we're keen on. Let's now start doing the, uh, the due diligence. So yeah, if you've got some parishes that you particularly want to look at, let me know. We've got people on this call that I know come on recently who are going to be coordinating um, areas around the Cliff Valley. So uh, we can start making those links. Yeah, I was, yeah, it's just because we're sort of getting some of the final, or not, some of those bits in place, you know, on the system, it doesn't mean that there's, you know, people can't start <laughs> doing things now, especially when we've got someone like Tim coordinating, coordinating things locally. Doing, as well. that, doing that priority, I mean, we're trying to cross Devon and trying to get a list of how many paths are there that we think it's worth going after? How many do we just cross off and say we're not even going to try for those? So then we can see what the size of the task is we don't have left. So this first phase is looking at each parish and deciding what paths in there we can just scrub and say we're not going to look at those and which ones we think there's some merit in and then we can get the, uh, the sizing out. How big's the problem? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Ian's got his hand up as well. I, uh, I've got a few questions, so I can probably, if uh, if people want to go after my next two questions, I'll, I'll maybe a couple at the end. Um, firstly, so I, I initially, I mean, got into this via the Don't Lose Your Way. Um, it's got what got me sort of inspired by this, but um, I found the British Horse Society had a, a pretty good application system called Dobbin they built, which was, as I was getting on it in the early days, um, was, was quite helpful for kind of guiding me for my first one that I've been working on. It, are there plans to coordinate or merge systems or how is the overlap between the two going to be handled? Yeah, so we do work closely with the BHS. Um, we will be sharing data from both the maps. I think we've got, they've got a lot of data in some areas and not much in others. We've obviously got a lot of data everywhere, but that needs re refining down in terms of the paths. Um, we are sharing We've got one, we're sharing evidence libraries where we can put historical documents that are of use with the BHS as well. Um, and I'm just, and I'm learning anything that we can, uh, you know, we're, we're working together very closely. I have a meeting uh, every two or three weeks with my counterpart at the BHS. So um, yeah, obviously, you know, they will, there's, there's a slight difference in some of the priorities for us, but that's fine in terms of quite a lot of their members will be looking at upgrading of rights because this can also be done through this process. So, um, you know, historically it was a, a bridal way or, 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 a, or, a, or a lane or a byway, and it's actually only marked as a footpath. Obviously the ramblers are not so uh, focused on those. And at the same time, the BHS won't be that focused on footpaths um so yeah we're working closely with them and if there is anything that you see that they're sort of you know particularly useful or whatever please you know let us know so the uh, the project the dobbin project yeah. is really good in terms of the the dmo kind of builder um you mentioned evidence libraries um is that something that is accessible is that just held into you know between you guys internally or is it something that's accessible or so obviously things are found online like know your place and those sorts of places but do you guys have another kind of internal library that we may be able to potentially be able to tap into yes so we um as i said we're sort of we, we're going in with the bhs they've got their links if they've got a library for devon Okay, they haven't got a library set up for Devon yet, but we will be setting up a library with them for Devon um, where we can hopefully collect the, some of the historical materials already been digitised by people who have been working on this. Um, and then also we, we're hoping to get some volunteers up in queue who can digitise additional stuff. And maybe you might even have people locally that are not that keen to do a whole application, but are very happy to spend days in the archives photographing things for other people so and we'd want to put it all in one place in that library but it's 
I'm just checked. It's not quite, it's not set up for Devon yet, but it's um, uh, but we will be setting it up. The the other thing just to flag is um, the Rambler's website. I'll put a link in the chat. Um, we do have. I put together. It's quite a long list of historical sources. Some of which might be helpful for a particular application. Some of which might not be. Um, lots of different web. Basically, where they're publicly accessible uh, online. Um, so I will put that in the chat. There are links to sort of national and general resources there. There's also a couple of links to things that have been digitized specifically for Devon as well. Um, but yeah, we, we want to bring everything, we're, we're bringing everything together, but it's um, it's not the quickest process, if you know what I mean. Um, but, you know, hopefully if people are going in and photographing a map you know, the idea is if someone's photographing a map for their in a particular application, they don't just photograph the bit of the map they need, but they photograph the whole thing, and then we can get we can get it put in the same place, and then that will sort of build up a repository. Okay, I'll ask one, one more for now, then, um, which was you mentioned open access land. Um, <laughs> is there any value in getting a footpath? entirely within open access land or is that not necessary given that it is open access should we only worry about ones connecting to and from or yeah tricky one that one uh i've had this is a personal view i suppose to some extent um because you know there's always different people with different views um for me they would be a low priority because of as you say there is access on foot is um you know assured um there is a couple of caveats for that um which are probably you know there's always caveats for everything uh, one is obviously there might be types of landscapes where actually having a path you know um that has to be clear of vegetation and things like that is um advantageous um and also there are some parcels of open access land where access to the land is difficult in terms of uh, you know it's all fenced off and there's no gates or styles or anything like that to get onto it e easily so it may be that having a right of way that that sort of crosses the boundary but is nearly all on open access land is um advantageous the other thing to flag i suspect it will be fine but the thing that i've always got at the back of my mind is that the 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 countryside and rights of way act um that brought in open access land calls for a decadal review of the land so potentially land could get d um deregistered as open access land now i suspect that most you know the vast majority of open access land won't be deregistered maybe a little bit will and a little bit will be added when they do that review the only thing to, to watch out for is that Sorry if I'm going a bit too long, guys. But because um, open access land is based upon currently, anyway, the first mapping of it was based upon habitat sites. Um, that's why you get quite weird um, shapes and stuff because they literally went and counted the number of types of habitats in certain areas that that then decided if it was chalk downland or not or improved land and therefore not open access. But anyway, because they did it on that. There are in some areas of the country an issue with, for instance, tree planting. So if you've got a piece of open access land that the landowner plants a load of trees on, it could then not be open access land next time it's mapped. And therefore a right of way would be important. But but my general thing, my general view, unless anyone has any other dis views, is that there probably would be a low priority. Thank you. I'll let anybody else go if they have questions um, still. Not a question, but just um, a comment. That's a really interesting link, Jack, that you've just sent to us in terms of finding historical sources. And that um, Peter, in a private message to me, I'd, I'd asked Peter what parishes he might be interested in. He mentioned Rockbeer. Um, in searching for enclosure maps for Devon, I see that Rockbeer does have an entry. Um, but in terms of the Cliffs Valley, it, it looks like closure maps are quite scant. But Peter, you might be interested to know that Rockbeer does have an enclosure map. 
it looks like it's for the maybe the, for the marsh green area um but uh, nevertheless that's interesting it's, it's got a railway line as well right <laughs> uh, well it's, yes indeed yeah um but the other thing to know with railway lines is that they had to say they didn't just have to in most cases where there's good quality maps and that is most cases they didn't just have to show on the plans rights of way that were you know crossed directly by the railway line but i think there was a there was a a, a margin of error sort of thing there was you know they had to show land a certain way either size you might have a path that historically you know will skirt you know quite near within you know 20 meters or whatever of the railway but not not be recorded that could be sharp on those but that's just a slight aside um, no it's a good one isn't it jack because um again thinking about uh, peter's expressed interest in rock beer wimple broadcliffe um uh having looked at the mapped uh, potential lost paths so far there are a few around well wimple for example um that look as though they're very close to the existing railway line yeah and the same with i don't know blue haze is that some place that some people know um i don't yeah. know it looks like yeah they're, they're, it looks like there's nearest this near station down there right it looks like on the map that i'm looking at there is some potential path sort of near there i don't know how useful they'd be but you know just to to flag that i mean it looks like they go from the station so that would be potentially quite useful near the station um but yeah was there any other questions now i can ask a couple more if, if that's all right um if, if nobody else wants to go first it's what we're here for. No, no, it's all good. No, no, I like, I like questions. <laughs> so I found a, um, so it's actually more of an open access land question. Um, so I guess two, two parts of this question. There's a little piece of land near where I am. Um, so there is Stoke Woods near, near, uh, near Exeter. This is a little tiny place called, um, uh, I forgot the name of it actually, that is just, just beside, um, but there is no easy way of getting to it. So there's a very, there's a main row, 60 miles an hour and a, steep wall you have to climb to get into it so like no one in their right mind is going to go in that way I guess first question is is there any like, I can't see anything on the ordnance survey maps or tithe maps or like any other sources that shows a way of getting there where what would you recommend so this is a, a, a piece of open access land yeah yeah is it is it uh where did you say it was sorry so it's, it's in Exeter, uh, it's in, in the, the boundaries of Exeter, and it's, it's according to Tithe Map, it's owned by the city council. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, yeah, because I'm just thinking what it probably was historically, because the only other pieces of open access land that have mapped are commons. Um, and it'd be interesting to know what that was. So if there is no access, there's no access points to it, as far as you know, that are publicly available. No, definitely not. No. I mean, the, the, the first thing I would say is to see if there are any potential lost rights of way that go to it. Um, it may be, if it's council owned, it may be worth exploring with them why, you know, what it is and, and, and how it's, you know, if it's, why it's not publicly accessible. Um, you know, we do, I do know of one local authority. I'm not saying that most of them will do this, but I know one local authority who, and it maybe doesn't quite answer this question, but they took they um, they working with local ramblers they mapped all paths potential lost rights away but mainly looking at you you know ones that were current use on the land they owned and then just did a big order to make them all rights away and they there was no one to oppose the order because they owned the land um <laughs> you know so um you, you know it might be it may be worth you know having a, a conversation with the council you know and, and and putting some pressure on to see if um see if that's possible I think the challenge is one is it's one one side is a steep is a steep road a steep wall and a and a and a, a um, sixty mile an hour road and the rest of it is a private owner. Uh, okay, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, also feel free to drop me an email and I can see if I can look. You know, it's useful to have a look at the maps and see if I can spot anything. But it, it may be tricky. Did you have another question? 
Um, yes, yeah, so I've got a, a three part route. I think this is, I might have emailed this, this, this question, but seeing if, if nobody else has any questions. I, I have a three part route where I have essentially a road that goes from the main highway all the way up to a farm, which I'm pretty confident I can get uh, registered as a uh, probably as a restricted byway. I have a road on the other side, which I'm hopeful also could go in as a either restricted byway or a or a bridleway. And in the middle, I have what probably looks to be a footpath. Um, they are also all on different maps as well. A lot of the sources are quite different. So, road A is on completely different ordnance survey maps. It is on because it, it, the boundary just happens to fall there. It's in a separate parish map, so they don't join up very well. Would you suggest I put those in as three separate applications, or would you suggest I put them in as one and Part of the question is the first route effectively would go to nowhere unless that footpath is secured. Yeah, that's a really good question. So my general advice, again, it you know be useful to look at. I'll look. I will go back to your email properly and look at that. Um, but my general advice would be that that an application. So it's fine to have more than one app route in an application, but essentially you want to be you want to be. Uh, to be the case where all of the path is using pretty much the same sort of evidence, if you know what I mean. So for instance, we've had people put an application in for a whole network of lanes that are unrecorded, but it's fine because they're all shown you know, in the same way and they're using the same evidence for all of those lanes. Whereas if you've got this issue with different evidence for different paths, it's worthwhile putting in three applications, I would say. Um, Obviously, that opens up the possibility of one being confirmed and one not. Um, it also opens up the interesting possibility of what happens if the middle bit's confirmed and the two, the other two at the end aren't. And then, you know, you've got a right of way. As I said, you can't have a right of way that's not attached to either and an another public right of way. So um, that would be the general advice that I would that I would say is that, you know, it's fine to put more than one route or sections of route in application. But if there is any doubt, I would separate them out. Um, and then hopefully the inspector or the council or it, the council, and then if it goes to the inspector, can sort it out. Thank you. But we're, we're trying not to give them an excuse in a way <laughs> to, you know, you don't want part of the route to fail because it's not clear that you, you, you know what I mean? You want to make it really the whole, the, it shouldn't be like this, but <laughs> the idea is that we really want to lead either the, the person at the council or if it gets to it, the planning inspector, really clear through argument and you're really holding their hand through the argument and that could get really mixed up if you've got a bit of evidence for one bit and a bit of evidence for another bit. Got it, thank you. Um, you mentioned earlier, I think on the last session that the, so the moment the highways authority, so at the moment we are responsible as the person that splits the application for notifying all the landowners uh, along the route. You mentioned that you're hopeful that the highway authorities will, because that was one of the recommendations that they would take that on. Would you suggest holding off on submitting a DMO if it is ready to go? Um, if it's submitted now, is there a risk that we'd still have to notify all the landowners personally? So there's, it's, it, this particular one I think of is quite a pain. I can't even work out who the landowners might be because there's lots of houses and they may or may not have, uh, you, you know, ha whether I need to notify them or not, I need to speak to the council. Yeah, that is a really good question. And there will be differing views amongst our volunteers about that. Um, my view would be that it's probably worth holding off for a little bit um, if you know what I mean, like, um, you, you know, and, and, and because we are hoping that the Deregulation Act provisions will come in. I mean, they were promised the, the last quarter of this year. I suspect that's not going to happen now, but it may be that they'll it'd be introduced by next summer. So I would probably advise that. Um, there's Because also there's other things in that act that may make it a bit easier in terms of getting a success. You know, depending on what type of landowner it is, that process is supposed to build in a bit more of a discussion and a sort of consensual discussion with the landowner. Now, it may be the sort of landowners that, you know, you think that's not going to be that particularly useful for some landowners, but I would probably say that, um, but others may have a different view on that. Um, 
especially some of our volunteers, you know, the deregulation act was passed in 2015. And so uh, if you've been holding on for the, the provisions of that, you've been holding on for six years at this point. So there is, you know, there, it's, it's difficult to say exactly. Does anybody else have questions they'd like to ask? It looks like Simon's got his hand up. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Th Thanks, Jack. I was just going to ask, um, one of the things that we can do, we do have budget um, for this work. One of the things that we could do is, is help with photocopying costs. Um, if, uh, if, if a volunteer um, wanted to go to the district record office and take photos of, for example, the enclosure maps, um, which we could pay for, um, What's the steerage, Jack, that you've got in terms of making that available um, more widely? Yeah, 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 yeah. The first thing I say is that, you know, obviously, yeah, I'm not giving legal advice and it's good to check with, I'm not saying you need legal advice for this question, but, you know, check with the, the organisation itself. We find that nearly all of them are comfortable with it. Um, because it's for non-commercial, you know, it's for educational use and non-commercial use. You know, if there is any slight difficulties, you know, you can make the argument that, well, this is, we're actually, um, you know, doing a, a public duty sort of thing. Like, you yeah. know, so for instance, we've got our OS base mapping on the Don't Use Your Way site is given to us for free by Natural England because they see what we're doing as, as you know, yeah. as benefit to the public. Yeah. That's the first thing. The, the only, the time where I, where it has been a bit tricky is there are some councils, and I don't know if this applies to Devon, that make money out of making their maps available through like CDs and stuff like that sort of thing. Obviously at that point, they, I suppose at one point you need to get it digitized, but the other side of it is that you can't, you know, they, that becomes a bit more tricky. But even in those cases, I, you know, I know that in Cornwall with the British Horse Society and our volunteers, you know, if you're a registered volunteer, you can get access to the data that you'd normally have to pay for, if you see what I mean. So there are ways around that, but, but we we find that actually it's it's usually fine unless there is some of those commercial things or just someone who's particularly worried about it at the archives. So uh, so linked to that, um, the dossier. So say say we've um, a volunteer's photocopied the enclosure map, then how? What's the best way to make it available? Um, can that be? posted on ramblers for access only by registered people or so, so our, 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 i think as the sort of answering ian's question so we're setting up with the bhs sort of libraries that will be accessed both by our volunteers and their volunteers yeah sort of um not everyone will be able to upload but if you can send us stuff you know or we can get someone locally who can have access permissions to upload things and um so that's where we're planning to to put them. With some counties, that's already set up. We haven't got it for Devon yet. Um, and essentially, I mean, anyone, I mean, sort of anyone can access that because the link would be from the BHS website, but also from the Ramblers. But it will be behind the volunteering sort of page, if you know what I mean. So mm. it's sort of semi-public, <laughs> if you see what I mean. Yeah. Uh, can I actually add a build on to that, if that's okay, Jack? Um, yeah. So I so I've been to the Devon County Archives. So I, I've answered just specifically for Devon, and they do make you sign an agreement uh, for everything you take a photograph of. So you have to write down a do list of documents that you've taken uh, a photo of, and essentially say that uh, you won't pass it on. Um, for the DMMO application itself, that's fine because there's an exception for copyright. But I would probably suggest that they get permission from the archives for any specific use beyond kind of keeping it on their own computer. Um, I, I'm actually hoping to have a, a conversation with them tomorrow about this when I go in. Yeah, that would be good. And it's maybe something for, not that I'm shifting on to Tim, but it may be something that, you know, locally we can potentially do some influencing with them or, or do, you know, request either from the grabblers or from the, from the Roots for Roots project, you know, around that and say, you know, it will be in these bounds because it's not like we're publishing it on a really open website sort of thing. But no, I do see that, Ian. And um, but we've had those, we have 
reach those agreements with other archives in different parts of the country as well. Um, so yeah, we've even reached agreements for things like reduced costs for volunteers for photographing and things like that. So, you know, often people are supportive. John? Yeah, I was just going to say, can you let us know what they say when you speak to them about that, uh, Ian? That would be really useful to hear what they've, what they've, what further they've said to you. I will do. Thank you. Yeah, I, I mean, that'd be great, to, Ian, because um, John and I have had a conversation, brief conversation about um, how the district record office might, um, we, we might be able to just um, have a um, purchase order with them and anyone operating under, uh, operating in the Cliff Valley area um, on Don't Lose Your Way could, um, make themselves known to them and and have photocopying paid for paid by the project but you know the, the record office will probably want a list of names or something like that um uh it'd be quite useful if you could find out from them how that could work because it could make life easier for them couldn't it rather than having um, individuals coming in um you know making rest requests for lots of photocopies of the same document. I'm rambling, sorry, it's, um, I'm not making sense now. <laughs> I mean, the other thing is, the other argument I would use to archivists if they were worried about this is, especially with things like enclosure maps and tide maps, would you, what would you prefer? Would you prefer one person photographs it and shares it amongst 20 people or that 20 people come in and take it down and unroll it? And, you know, they've, they've got a duty to protect the, the records as well. Now, you know, I'm not saying they're not doing their duty, but, you know, that's another way of putting it, isn't it, really? That, that you know, it's, you know, the more you get down, especially, you know, some of these things like tide maps, which are massive maps sometimes on, you know, vellum, <laughs> it can, you know, it can really degrade the records. I think we're at half past now, so I don't know if there's any other burning questions, but um, I'm happy for my email to be shared. Um, I'm taking on some other work at the Ramblers at the moment, so it's a bit manic <laughs> for the next month or so, but um, I will try and get back to people as soon as possible if they do have follow-up questions. Um, but yeah, and, and I'd be very happy to, I mean, me and John and Simon haven't talked about it, but if not straight away, but at some point, especially once we sort of, I've come down and met Tim and we've done some of that, you know, maybe if there is need for follow-up sessions, I'm sure we could do something. John? Yeah, that would be, that would be great, Jack. And I, I think um, Simon and I will make sure we stay in touch with Tim and yourself. Um, so anyone who's kind of keen in pressing on already uh, with, chasing paths, especially if you're working in the Cliss Valley area, um, get in touch with us. Uh, or if you're wanting to be uh, kept standing by, as it were, for when the Ramblers have got more resources available in due course, uh, do again, let us know that. Uh, and I know the other thing that Jack and I had talked about previously is the possibility that Jack might be able to make enough time to kind of come down and do a face-to-face -face training day or session with us um, next year um, which would be great obviously uh, and obviously if we know that you're keen and waiting then we'd make sure that we let you know about that so if you apart from anything else if you haven't done it I would recommend that you sign up to our email mailing list for the Clist Valley Regional Park which you will see in the footer section the signature section of any email correspondence you've had from me about this session this evening uh, and if you register for that email mailing list you'll get notified of any events that we've got coming up uh, I don't think I had anything else to add Do, can you think of anything else to add Simon no um, no I think that um, Tim has suggested that we have a, a sort of offline conversation about how we can uh, support him uh, and you know the um, sub coordinators and indeed you know people like 
um, Ian and Peter on the line now in Rosebury. So um, let's let's do that and let's um, continue to sort of work up the the strategy, if you like. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah I mean, that's that, that, gone, Jack. No, I say that sounds good. I mean, you know, not that I'm making excuses, but you know, with Don't Use Your Way, we're there's different situations in different counties, so it's sort of working out what works best with different groups and stuff. So, um, but I suppose the only thing I'd say is that we're trying to do everything as flexibly as possible that we're providing to, to support different situations and stuff. Um, and just finally, sorry, Peter, Peter early on, you know, he's obviously champing at the bit and wants to get stuck in. I, I mean, I suppose the advice, Jack, is it, it, to Peter would be to register and to, to start commenting on some of the paths that have been identified. I mean, that would be invaluable at this stage. Yeah, we definitely love some prioritisation to go on. And um, and I think also if, if Peter could link up with Tim as well to see if there's you know, other things or, or, yeah, I think that would be great. I've already spoken to Tim um, a couple of months ago, so uh, we'll follow up on that, and I'll certainly uh, register. Great, great. And I, I sent know if you got any feedback. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I, I sent you that email with the link in it, Peter. Brilliant. Okay, well, uh, I, I guess then uh, our time has come, as it were, and even um, even the extended directors can't, can't go on longer than this. So uh, I would just like to say thanks very much to Jack for giving his time to us this evening and answering our questions so uh, <laughs> so brilliantly. Yeah, it's been really it's been really interesting, Jack. Thanks very much, and we'll stay in close touch uh, with what Don't Lose Your Way is doing. Um, and, and, and hopefully manage to recruit more people who want to take up the, the banner or the torch and continue to run with it. Um, exactly. Yeah, no, no, that'd be great. No, it's been really, it's been a real pleasure. And yeah, we'll definitely keep in touch today.